Thank you very much. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr. Witness. Good morning, sir. How are you this morning? I'm very well and ready to continue the process. Thank God. Uh, we welcome you and everybody. Uh, you will continue with your presentation from when you started yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to start with, I think, one of the last sentences I uttered before we left here. And apparently that sentence was, became a banner headline in the Inquirer newspaper. And it said, U.S. approached me on Doe's successor. That's how the um, Inquirer put it. I remember saying that I have to talk more because there are more things to be said. And I said, that I was called to the city department about successor to Doe, to President Doe. I would like to start from that point and I will go back to some other points. I served in the United States of America as the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the Embassy of Liberia between 19... 1984 and 1987. In 1983, I was removed from the uh, New Liberian newspaper because I had written that editorial entitled, Lest We Forget, which I talked about yesterday. And I was told by Dr. Peter Nyangao, who was the uh, Minister of Information, that because of that editorial, the head of state in 1983, Samuel Doe, said that since I like too much book business, they should remove me from the paper and send me to London to be the press counselor there because uh, this lest we forget thing that to my book we never talking now. So like some other people who in the past were sent into the foreign service not because they were being promoted but they were sent into a political exile. And so I was preparing to go to London as press and cultural counselor. In March 19 83, I was called back to the Ministry of Information and was told that I was no longer going to London because Mr. Jonathan Riffle, who had been assigned to Washington, D.C. at the time that I was appointed to London, had declined to go to Washington, D.C. because he said that most of many of his friends who were in the Talbot government lived in the United States and he will be better in London promoting the image of government than among his friends. And so I was told that I would now go to Washington, D.C. So my assignment switched, and I went to Washington, D.C. I served there until 1984, about March. And the Union of Liberian Association in the Americas was having a demonstration against the administration of President Doe. It was during that time that most of the people in the government today were in exile. And they had a strong collaboration with the union. By that time, Thomas Wuyu was head of the union. And they were having a demonstration in front of the White House. As the press counselor at the embassy, it was my duty and also correspondent for the Liberian News Agency, it was my duty to go and cover that press conference, I mean the, the demonstration, in order to inform the government of Liberia because of my job. I went there and saw people who are new from the past. 
I saw a gentleman called Charles Hennings, who grew up with me as a childhood friend in Riverside, and other friends. And they came and shook my hands, and we talked. They were demonstrating against the government, and, but <laughs> I knew them before they started demonstrating. So I couldn't just stop talking to them because they were demonstrating. So we stood up in front of the White House, and we shook hands, we talked, and all of that. And some people took the photographs and other things and uh, used that to tell the government that, in fact, I had joined the opposition and that I had, in fact, helped to organize the demonstration. When the head of state got to hear that, he ordered my immediate recall from Washington, D.C. That was about May 1984. When they recalled me from Washington, D.C., I was also written and told not to go around the embassy of Liberia because now I have become a dissident element against the government and that I should stay home away from the embassy until my tickets arrive to relocate me. While that was happening, sources available to me in Morovia informed me that upon my arrival, I would not be going home. I would be going to a safe location somewhere in Lofa County. And so um, I was warned to delay my stay as much as possible. Well, as God would have it, I did not delay my stay. I got ready to come home, but the government at that time could not find the money to send me home. Minister Gao Jones was Minister of Finance. He will attest to this. They didn't find the money to send me home until almost the, the beginning, the middle of June 1984. The money came, I flew home. By then, investigations had proven that what they said about me was not true. And then I arrived in town and decided to go to the mansion to meet the head of state and answer to his call for my recall from Washington, D.C. I found it difficult meeting with the head of state at the mansion. Every day I would go, they would say the head of state said that um, he know that you are here. Please go home and uh, relax. He will send for you. And for more than a month, I could not see him. I went to the Ministry of Information and the minister said, well, the president called you, you go to the, ma to the mansion. I go to the mansion, I couldn't see the president. Then one day while I was sitting in the waiting room, Minister Gao Jones, Minister of Finance, came to see the president, the head of state though. And he shook my hand and said, my man, how are you coming on? I said, I'm all right. I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, they, they recall me. I've been here for one month. I can't see the head of state. He said, oh, that's, is that so? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, I'm going in to see the president, said, the head of state. I said, okay, tell him I'm here. So Minister Jones went in, and according to Minister Jones's own explanation, he forgot to tell the president I was outside. And they went on with a normal conversation regarding the affairs of the financial situation in Liberia. And at a certain point in time, just before he could come outside, President, uh, head of state door told him, said, you see how ungrateful Boya is? These Basa people, they're very ungrateful. I sent him to Washington, D.C. to work, and he joined the opposition against me. He'd be, be organizing demonstrations and doing all kinds of things there. And I sent for him, he said he's not coming here. He's, one month now, he, he hasn't returned home. So Minister June said, uh, you talking about Emmanuel Boya? He said, yes. He said, but the man is sitting outside there telling me that he's been here one month and nobody will allow you to see him. He said, no, they're not true. So Minister June said, okay, send for him. So Minister June left and came outside and told me, said, the, the head of state will soon send for you. I went in, and 
And when the head of state saw me, he was sitting down, he stood up. He said, Booyah, I said, he said, are you? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you? I said, yes, sir. Three times he asked me, I said, yes, that me. Then he dropped in his seat like somebody pushed him down. And he said, damn it, the librarian book can lie. He said, the told me, you, are, you say you're not coming here. I said, I've been here one month. They won't let me see you. He said, but I heard that you've been organizing, organizing against me. You've been against me. I said, sir, you remember since you came to this office, every year they bring me here for being against you? I said, you remember the first year they brought me here when Falavani died at the junction of ELWA and Peaceville Highway? When Falavani died in a car? And they were planning his funeral. And one of the guys wrote there, in memorial or in, in memoriam of Falavani. And I was administrative assistant, or special assistant to Gabriel Nimlin, the Minister of Information. And I told him it was wrong for saying in memoriam of, I mean in, memor in memoriam of, it should be in memory of or in memoriam, not in memoriam of. That guy left the Ministry of Information, went straight to the Capitol building, and told people there that the former uh, 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 general coordinator of the Jewish Party, who in the Ministry of Information now, talking all kind of things about Falavani, he vexed because the government having a good funeral for Falavani. Councilman Samson, who was in charge of the information for the PRC, moved down to the Ministry of Information for a group of soldiers moved into Gabriel Nimlin's office and told him to send for me. I went there. He told Gabriel Nimlin that this man is dismissed. We don't want to see him in the yard. He against us. He counter-revolutionary. And Gabriel said, but what happened? Let, let him investigate. He said, no investigation. I am the chairman of the information, and this man is dismissed. And so I had to walk out of that yard. And I said, you remember? I wrote to you, head of state do, to tell you I want an, a prompt investigation. If you found me guilty, you should execute me. I said, you remember that? I said, I wrote that letter because three weeks ago, you had said that there were counter-revolutionaries in the government. And three weeks after that, they charged me with counter-revolutionary activities. So I wrote to tell you to, I wanted an investigation. If I were guilty, you should execute me. Willie Gibbings was then Deputy Minister of State for Public Affairs. Head of State Doe instructed Willie Gibbings to organize a group of people to, to look into the case. So because it was an editorial matter, they requested the USIS to second someone to serve on that board and they sent Reverend Dan DeMore. I do not know whether he's living or dead now, but he was working with USIS at that time. Dan DeMore. They have Omen Baiti Moore and somebody from the mansion, Willie Gibbings from the mansion, and other people to serve on that committee to study the document to see whether what I said was true, to see whether I had any in, uh, ill intent against the revolution because they said that because I was a true reported man, I was against the revolution. That committee investigated and reported to the government, to head of state Doe, that I was right. You cannot say in memoriam of. That's not English. Good English say in memory of or in memoriam. Not in memoriam of. But that what happens when people don't go to the civil service to take an exam before they get a job in this country. You have all kind of dumb, stupid people assuming office and trying to play down on people who know what they're talking about. You cannot do that. And so... The head of, then I told the head, I said, I said, you remember that? He said, yes. I said, you remember, I told, told him incident of every year that they had taken me to him for being against the revolution. From the day the revolution started, until the day Doe left the mansion, I was taken there for counter-revolutionary activities. And I told you yesterday to contact Mr. Valentine, who used to keep the records. He can go to the mansion now, look in the information files, and you will see these letters that I wrote exonerating myself. 
President Doe wrote me through Mr. Willie Givings, clearing me of all counter-revolutionary charges. And then he called me back to the mansion and said he was reassigning me because, he's, as he put it, you got bad luck at the Ministry of Information, so I don't want you to work there anymore. I said, yes, sir. Then he said, you know what happened? They lie on you. I checked with the NSA and all these people. They are checked everywhere. You did not help to organize any demonstration against me. So the people lie on you. He said, you know what happened? I said, no, sir. He said, I won't make them shame. Tell me anything you want. I will give it to you today. You want house? You want car? You want job? Anything you want, I will give it to you so they can be shame. And I just looked at him. And you know, I was six months older than the president, the head of state. And I always should tell him that you are my small brother. I said, small brother, you know, you are head of state. I said, I have a military mentality, but I never joined the army. And in the military, the commander gives the command. So I may have my wishes, but you are the commander. Anything you say that good for me, I will take it. He said, no, Booyah, man, tell me what you want. Anything you want, we'll give it to you now. You want car, you want house, you want job, anything, any kind of job you want. I said, I don't want anything except what you want to give me. Then he laughed. He said, you know what I decided? I said, no. He said, I decided you're not going back to America. I said, thank you very much. I don't want to go back to America. Now, when you're dealing with, with, with the head of state at that time, you have to have a rapid deployment force in your mouth. As soon as he says something, he answer he right back. I said, I don't want to go back to America. I will stay here with you. He laughed. He said, you know, you're not going back to the Ministry of Information. You got bad luck there. So um, go to the refinery, tell Elita Johnson, I sent you there. She might find a job for you. I said, Mr. Head of State, I cannot go there now. He said, why? I said, I still hold an executive commission from you as press and cultural counselor to Washington, D.C. You have not withdrawn your commission. How can I go somewhere else to get another job? That's not protocol. He said, oh, I see. The person you have here, do not bring your dry face, boss of business to me. I had a head of state. I tell you, go to the woman to get your job. You say, you're not going? I said, I'm not going. I sat there. He rang a bell. Minister Blamo came in. He said, Blamo, call Elida Johnson. Minister Blamo, call Elida Johnson. He got on the phone. Elida, Elida, I sent him Buya there for him. Can he want a job? Brap, he dropped the telephone. Get out of my office. I got out of his office. I'm telling you this story to take you to this headline. And I hope you have patience with me. I'm a teacher, a natural born teacher. So I don't get in a hurry to say things. I like to explain things. And the reason why I like to explain things is because when I was minister information, I was like my own schoolmate, Larry. Larry and myself went to Wesley Seminary. And I listened to Larry and I laughed and I said I used to be like that. I mean, Larry's a fiery guy. He talks all these things, you know. I used to be like that. One day I came home and my mother, who was a market woman, called me. He said, my son, I said, yeah. He said, all that BB thing you're talking on the radio today, I ain't here, yo. He said, all that BB English, I ain't here, nothing. So sit down right here and tell me my own. So from that day on, I had to break down into simple terms everything I said on radio or TV because my mother said she could not understand me. So I hope you have patience because I'm a storyteller and I tell it as it is. And I must inform you, God has blessed me that all my witnesses, most of them are alive. 99% of them are alive with blood running through their veins. You know, God bless me. Last night I went to bed and I prayed, God, you know I'm going to talk the truth, but you got to back me up. All my papers I want to display, they are not here. They are in the United States. So you got to back me up. This morning, about one and a half hours ago, I got a telephone call from a friend from the 70s. He said, my man, how are you? I said, where are you? He said, I'm in this town. I said, well, you better show up at the pavilion today because you are my live witness. So Unzuba Cooper 
who later on became Uzba Kimen Gamai, is in Morovia. He called me this morning, and he's supposed to be among the people in this gathering today. And most of what I will be saying, he will be my living witness because he was my roommate at the University of Liberia for about three years. We went through all of these things, organizing all kinds of things. So I just wanted to let you know that my God has been good to me. Like the songs that the Lord has promised good to me. My witnesses are all alive. That's why I say I will not come here unless I swear to tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because this country will not be healed until we openly discuss our problems. Every time you want to talk. I mean, I like my friends. Many of my friends have called me since day before yesterday, last night. Oh, you know, the library, you got to be careful. They both start looking at you differently. They have been looking at me differently since I was born. Since I was born, everybody thought I was crazy. I talk big talk. When my, my mom start talking, I, I just talk. Because I talk the truth. And when you're talking the truth, you don't have to worry because you don't have to, re you don't have to find another story to back up the truth. The truth is a, tr is a truth all by itself. So, he told me, he called Alita and told me to go there. And he told me to get out of his office. I got to Alita and she said, okay, my special assistant, Mr. Chenoweth, has been uh, promoted to another job and that vacancy is here, so... You can become a special assistant since the president sent you here, the head of state. Oh, it's a 25,000 US dollar job a, a year, uh, free car, a gas tank full every day, free lunch, free everything. And I said, Lord, let us now that seven depart in peace. I don't have to go back in the government. I can stay here for the rest of my day, build my house overnight. I don't have any expenses or nothing. And I was there at the refinery, much to my surprise, returning from lunch 2 o'clock one day, hidden near the, the, the bridge across at the car factory, 2 o'clock news came on. The head of state had been pleased to make the following appointments. Mr. Ahaji G. V. Kroma, Minister of Information. Mr. Carlton Kappe, Minister, Deputy Minister of Information. Mr. Emmanuel Boyer, Assistant Minister of Information for Public Affairs. It is the directive of the Head of State that these officials will assume their responsibilities effective immediately. I got very angry and I was glad I was alone in the car because I was cursing everybody from the Head of State down. But I was all alone. So there was a safe environment. I cursed them up in the car moving to the refinery. I said, what is this? Do you know by that they have reduced my pay by several thousand dollars? Many, many thousand dollars? So I got angry. I said, I will not take it. I will not take it. But then I said, if you don't take it, where you going? You're trapped, boy. You're trapped. So I went to the refinery. When I got there, the letter of appointment was already there. The security handed it to me at the door. I went in, and I was very angry. But usually when bad things start to happen to me, when I think bad things are happening to me, I do not know God is orchestrating it in the background. So immediately I got a, a, a thought came to my mind. Go to the ministry now and assume your position. Do not let these people know that you are angry because of this appointment. So I went and told the managing director of the refinery goodbye. I was going to the ministry to assume my office. She said, but you just appointed you. I said, yeah, you heard the, the term effective immediately. I am following that term. Effective immediately. So goodbye. I moved to the office. And I think we had a cover was the assistant minister. Yes, we had a cover. And I went there and said, I want my job. But we had to say, but we are again, we just got a point again. I said, look, effective immediately means effective immediately. I'm going to the minister, Peter Naga, to tell him I'm taking this office today. So I went to Peter and told him, I've come to assume office. He said, but we are going to have a 10 hour ceremony. I said, no, go back to the mansion. Effective immediately means right now, and I want my job now. I didn't want to come there, but you know, 
as I told you, I mean, you got to have strategies in your head to keep it surviving. They, they thought I was going to get vexed. Now I acted like I was not vexed. So Peter and I got pick up the telephone and call Willie Givings at the mansion to, to tell Willie Givings that I was, you know, he didn't understand me. I had come and demanded to take my job. So they put me on and he said, well, you know, you got with." I said, look, the mansion said effective immediately. So the only way it will happen is except you go and tell the head of state that I came to take my job and the people refused for me to take the job. And let him say what happened, then I would do it. They went in and do it. Say, tell the man, he's going to wait until they turn it over ceremony. I said, okay, I went home. Went to sleep, trying to calm myself down. I was at that Ministry of Information in 1984. I mean, when I took over as uh, Assistant Minister for Public Affairs, that was the most decisive time in my career in a PRC government. Between June and August 1984. That is when between June and August, between June and September, that is when the university campus was invaded by soldiers. That is when the constitutional, the referendum for the constitution was almost aborted. That is when the result of the of the of the referendum was locked up in a vault in the Firestone Plantations Company because the government refused to announce it. Why do I have to go through all of this? So that the younger children will know, young children will understand how we got where we got. People just see us moving around. They don't know what we have been through. There's a song that says that nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Now, I went to the Ministry of Information, all fired up from Washington, D.C., where I had served as press counselor, and they had recalled me. So when I got there, I decided we're going to run this thing a professional way. Kromar had been a friend of mine for a long time. We were at the University of Liberia together. We were in two different parties, but we're still friends. He was in the student uh, unification party. I was in uh, the all-student ally party. Soup won the election for 10 years in a row, and we used to call Soup the TWP on campus because TWP always winning elections. Soup always won the elections, but after the elections, Soup would call us to help to run the show. I was never a member of Soup, but it was on Soup approval that I went to several countries to represent the student union. What was evolving at the University of Liberia was a situation where we were learning how a um, ruling party could win the election and bring in all the other opposition to work in the government. That is what we were learning when the government panicked and started banning student politics and sent everything underground, only to explode as April 12, 1980. If the government had not panicked, and send people underground. We will have learned how a ruling party can take over and call in the opposition to help run the show. That what was happening. I never served the ruling, I was never in the ruling party, but I was always helping to run the show on campus. So as I said, I came and told Kromar, now I am your assistant minister of information. We are friends, but I will serve you professionally. And so every day that I was assistant minister, I wrote a memorandum to the Minister of Information, Al Haji Kroma, outlining to him the government PR or public relations priorities for the day. And I asked him some, not too long ago, he said he still has copies of the memorandum. So those who felt that we were suppressing this and were suppressing that should go and retrieve from Mr. Kroman the memorandum I wrote to him over the period of time, the memoranda, and read what I said. 
let's start with first things first the government announced that there would be a referendum to review to, to, to approve or disapprove the constitution as was written by the Sawyer's Commission and revised by the Kessley Commission I was Minister of Assistant Minister of Information Carlton Carpet Deputy Ahaji Kroma Minister I outlined a program for the referendum pre-referendum publicity publicity during the referendum publicity after the referendum and publicity for announcing the results of the referendum we didn't just run them because we're friends they're talking in the corridor every day i was sending mr kroma an official document telling him how the ministry will run in terms of pr for that day when we put everything into gear we got a call from the people's redemption council that the council wanted to make a statement to the people of Liberia by and through the speaker Jeffrey Batu Mr. Steve Makundu was working at that time with ELBC and because ELBC and information were closely coordinating and cooperating we had ELBC to send Steve Makundu to interview General Batu, Jeffrey Batu. Steve Makundu got there, Jeffrey Batu did not sit in his office. He said he wanted to make this broadcast in front of the Capitol building with the Capitol building in his background. He made this broadcast, Steve Makundu brought it to the information ministry because in those days I decided, and I told Mr. Kroman, that anything that happens here, I will get executed because I'm the gatekeeper here. They will blame me for it. So nothing will go on radio, government radio, or government television that I do not know about. No matter who it comes from, I should know about it. I should read it. I should think that it makes common sense before I allow it to pass. Because anything that happens, they will come looking for me. And he agreed. So Steve Makundu brought the video tape to me. I had a very large, a giant sized screen that was taller, uh, six feet tall. That the government had in the office that to screen videos and things before they are played. In my office, and I pushed that video in and I laid back to hear what Batu had to say. And the speaker of the People's Redemption Council, Jeffrey Batu, on the eve of the referendum, that means the day before the referendum was supposed to be held, all the boxes, ballot boxes have been sent to all the counties and territories in those days. Everything was ready. Election Commission, everybody ready to conduct this referendum. And Batu stood in front of the television and said that there will be no referendum tomorrow. There will be no referendum tomorrow. Ask Mr. Kroma, he will attest to that. Ask Mr. Steve Makundu, who videotaped it, he will attest to that. Ask Mr. Batu, that is in um, North Carolina, he will attest to the fact that he said so. And I want you to also ask Mr. Jackson E. Doe, the Minister of Transport, because I finally gave that tip to him in the United States, and I will tell you how he got it. Be patient with me. I'm an old man who loves to talk long story. So, Batu said, we are not going to have a referendum tomorrow. The PRC has met and we have decided that we didn't get anything out of this whole revolution thing. If we go back to the barriers, we, we got nothing to go by way. We got nothing to live on. There's no money for us to go to school, for us to do business. He outlined a lot of things and said because of these things, there will be no refer referendum tomorrow. I call Mr. Kroman by telephone. I said, uh, Ahaji, I said, come to my office immediately. We are in trouble. 
he came over to my office. I said, relax, sit down. I rewound the tape and start playing it. And when Batu got through talking, I turned to Kroma. I said, Mr. Kroma, he said, yeah. I said, we've been friends from LU days. You know that. He said, yes. I said, we've been in opposition parties in the, at the university. He said, yes. I said, now we find ourselves in the PRC, People Redemption Council government. He said, yes. I said, I just want to let you know that that tape you just watched is our death warrant. Ask Kroma, I told him that. I said, that tape you just watched is our death warrant. If that tape is played in this town, it was supposed to be played 8 o'clock that night. I said, if that tape is played in this town, I guarantee you, you will not see the rising sun tomorrow morning. I will die also. And you, I said, and you know what happened? I'm not going to die for foolishness. This tape will never be played in this town. I asked Mr. Kroma. He's alive. He will tell you. You see some of us here acting calm and not saying anything. It's not that we're dumb. We have taken our stand, but like my father made me swear to fight from within and not fight from without. So my fighting has been inside, fighting from within. I told Kroma, this tape will not be played. If it is played, I will die tonight. I said, you know what will happen? The Liberian people will assume that you and myself and I, you and I, orchestrated this thing to keep the PRC in power so we can become, we can stay as assistant minister and minister. I said, you think this, this is what I'm supposed to be doing in life, assistant minister? I said, our assistant minister before Toba died. Our assistant minister before Toba died. And our assistant minister, I want to be to kill the referendum. I said, you now, Kroma, go to the mansion and tell the head of state Doe that we have seen this video and we are not going to play it because it's not in his best interest. Go and tell him. Kroma left, he went to the mansion. Came back. I said, what happened, man? The man said, he said, I went there, the man asked me, and that the speaker said it. He said, yeah, it's okay, the speaker represented PRC. If the speaker said it, that all will happen, go play it. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, it's okay, Kroma, I beg you. I'm not dying tonight. While Kroma was going to the mansion for the first time, I went to some of my relatives in Basel community and gave them the video to put under their mattress. When he came back, I said, Kroma, the video is missing. I cannot find it. Go and tell Doe and the PRC, I'm prepared to be executed, but I can't find the tip. They won't go make another tip before 8 o'clock tonight, let them make it, but I can't find that tip. I said, but Kroma, listen to me. You and myself will die tonight if we play that tip. And I said, you know what happened, Kroma? I will be glad for the PRC to execute me. Then for the people of Liberia to drag me through the street and my name go down in history as the people, part of the people who are trying to suppress the Constitution and they got killed by the people. I said, they will not talk, tell me no E.J. Roy story that was not true. So Kroma, I'm telling you, go back to the mansion. And tell do what I say. Kruma went back. He came back and he, he by the time he came back well, after nine o'clock in the night. The tips should have been played at eight. He came back after nine, the news was over. Because he explained to me that when he got there, the head of state was cutting his hair in the presence of Abraham Colley and some other people. And Kruma went back there and said, Chief, uh, we uh, at the Ministry of Information, we want to tell you respectfully that it's not in government best interest to show that tip. We should have the referendum. He said, Doe got angry and pulled the tower from around his neck and decided to slap Kroma with the tower. And Kroma grabbed the tower and be, the tension between them uh, uh, pulled Doe out of his chair. And Doe said, oh, you won't fight me? You won't fight me? Then Abraham called him and all of them had to tell Doe that Kroma is a crazy boy. No mind, they start begging, oh chief we beg you, oh chief we beg you. In that confusion, the news passed. The referendum was never cancelled. By nine o'clock when Kroma came back, the tip could not be found. And the referendum had to go on the next day. And so the referendum went on. Because somebody gotta stand up sometimes to do something. I'm not saying this to boast about myself 
Because I'm a coward. That's why I ran away from the war. But there is a time. One of my old friends, he died now, George Dunbar Knuckles, told me that time and place makes, make the bold timid. The same time and place make the timid bold. A coward can become bold when there is a need to stand up and be counted. And Mr. Kroma will tell you, I was prepared to die that night. That's why I sent to tell the mansion that before we kill this constitution, execute me. My revolutionary business is not in the street making noise. It's telling people truth to their faces. That is what we call in seminary, speaking truth to power. When Daniel would dare to tell me bigger needs are something, when Joseph would dare to stand before Pharaoh, and, and Moses could come back later on to stand before Pharaoh. That's my kind of revolution. Speaking the truth, even if you die speaking it. That is why, that's when I understood why God gave me a big mouth. A big mouth that will not keep quiet when wrong is being done. But you will not hear me shouting in the street. I fight from within. There's an old song I used to like. It says, I do my crying in the rain. And when you cry in the rain, people can't tell the difference between your tears and the, and the rain. So they don't know you are crying. And so you do your crying in the rain. Okay, the ballots went out. The referendum was held. The PRC strategy for killing the Constitution died. 1984. They went to the second thing. The referendum was held. Everything was all right. The head of state appeared on TV. In those days, the Minister of Information, Chroma, and the Dep Assistant Minister, Buya, never went home until 9 o'clock in the night. Because we had to sit in the information ministry, watch the TV news, at the end of the news, wait for 30 minutes. If nobody come to get us from the mansion, then we are free to go home and sleep. People didn't know what we went through, the tension we went through. Anything on that TV that didn't go right would be they would come to get us. So one evening we were sitting there waiting for the TV news to be over. Instead of the regular news being broadcast on TV, the national anthem played. And then we panicked. Because usually when national anthem play, it means that the head is still going to speak or it means that somebody had taken over the government. And since the marshal didn't tell us that they were going to speak, and we heard the national anthem play. We started looking at each other and said, but what's going on? What's going on? Then we saw Doe. And then we saw Abraham Cully and some other people. And the head of state sat there and said, ladies and gentlemen, I've come to announce that the People Redemption Council have been dissolved. And in the place of the People Redemption Council, we have established an interim national assembly. And I'm president. I turned to Kuma and said, now explain that to me now, I know good English. But what's the connection? The International Assembly has been organized and he is president of what? Of the assembly or of Liberia? What is it? Kuma said, my man, we gotta think about this thing. Okay. I said, the next morning I came to work and said, Kuma, I, I want your permission to go to the mansion and find out whether Doe is president of the International Assembly or if he is president of Liberia. Because before the end of the day, BBC will be calling, I got to speak like an intelligent man. So I went to Willie Givings and said, Mr. Givings, the head of state dissolved the PRC, organized the International Assembly, and he said, I'm president. Please go and ask him whether he is president of the assembly or he president of Liberia. Because we want to publish the news, we don't know how to publish it. He went in and came out and said, those things you must say, just why he said the people will understand. I, I told him, I said, Mr. Givings, please go back in there and tell him that I am assistant minister of information. I have been in the information business for a long time and I don't understand. How can I explain to the people? So tell him, make it clear to him. I said, did you really tell him what I said? Tell him I want to know whether he's president of Liberia or president of the International National Assembly. 
That's a difference. Person of the assembly means you preside over the assembly. Person of Liberia means we have already elected you. And I don't, I don't see any election around here. So let him tell you. He came back in outside and he said, okay, the door say he might tell the people he's president of the assembly. I said, thank you very much. So now we knew that Doe was president of the assembly and not president of Liberia because by that time we had not had an election. You see, if some of us had panicked and refused to push the case, Doe would have declared him self president then and there would be no need for election because they wanted to kill the constitution anyway. So they had the election, they had the referendum, and then they said they set a day for the referendum results to be announced. And then they declared that politics was open, the ban was lifted on political activities, and President, uh, Head of State Doe said that all those in his government who were interested in politics should resign immediately. And they started to resign. A lot of them resigned. Then the days were approaching when they had to announce the referendum result. I went back to Mr. Kroma with my, ref my, my memorandum outlining the protocol for announcing the results of the election of the referendum. Pre-referendum announcement, post-referendum announcement, and the coverage for the protocol announcing the referendum. Everything lined up. We came to find out two days before time we could not get Omer Harmon, Emmett Harmon, the election commissioner, to tell us anything straight about the referendum results that should have been announced two days later. We said that you are supposed to announce this thing two days later. We should have the publicity now. So why are you keeping quiet? He said, oh, don't worry, we'll get back to you. You boys, just, you, you just wait. We know what we're doing. I said, okay. That went on and went on and went on. After the head of state had announced the lifting of the ban on politics, that very week, that, was, that very week, the one who was supposed to announce the referendum result, Dr. Sawyer decided he was going to launch his political party at the Duco Palace Hotel, or what became the Duco Intercontinental Hotel. When it was first dedicated, it was called the Duco Palace Hotel. Later on, it got changed to the Duco Intercontinental Hotel. So, I sat down and I thought about the whole thing, and I went back to Kruma. I said, you know what happened? These people will announce this result. Just give me a few hours. I'll put together a strategy that will make these people announce this result. So I went and sat down and thought about it. And then I said, you know what happened, Kroman? Call Omer Harmon. And Kroman is here, you should ask me everything I say. I said, call Omer Harmon and tell him that Sawyer is launching his party tomorrow at the Duca. And the only thing we got for the headlines for tomorrow is the launching of Sawyer's party. That will be the national headlines in the newspaper, on TV, and on the radio. And you know very well they do not want that to be the headline. So tell him if he cannot release the referendum result that he's supposed to release tomorrow, Sawyer will take the headlines. So Kruman called Omer Hammer and told him that Omer Hammer said, I'm on my way to you. Omer Hammer came. But when Omer Hammer came, we had, we had already videotaped Sawyer's party activities at the Duca. We had already videotaped it. And we plug it into the thing and we had Omer Hammer sitting there and he saw the whole thing when Sawyer said that Doe wanted to be the referee and the player at the same time. If Doe wanted to run, he should resign like the other people and go and run. He cannot be referee and player. He said a lot of things. And I turned to him and said, Mr. Chairman, that is the headline tonight on ELBC and ELTV. Unless you can release the results of the referendum, that is our headline, what Sawyer is saying. So what do you prefer? He said, okay, I come just now. He ran down the steps. He went for some time. We didn't hear from the old man. I told Kroma, I said, look, 
my father had told me a lot about Liberian politics. The old man told us to hold on, he going to come back. If he doesn't come back and we announce anything, he will say he told us to hold on. So we have to find another way to break this thing. I said, look, give me a few minutes. I call up Isaac C. Nyemplu, who was serving on the commission. I said, I want to see you at the Ministry of Information urgently. He came. When he came, I said, to, you're supposed to announce this referendum result today. Tell me, why are you not doing it? We don't hear any publicity. Nyemplu said, well, I want to tell you something confidentially. I said, yeah, what is that? He said, I've been behind, been behind Omer Hammer for the result. I've been behind him for a long time. He's just dodging us. And he just told us that Doe put him on an oath to take the referendum result and carry the Firestone and lock it up in the manager vault in Firestone because they will not announce it. I said, really? He said, yeah, I said, they will announce it. They will announce it. I said, you know what? I want you to help me so they can announce it. He said, how can I help you? I said, go to the mansion right now and ask to see head of state Doe. When they allow you to see him, tell him that Emma Hammer told you that he do put Hammer on the oath to lock up the resort in Firestone Vault and see how he react. So Nyemblu went there and did exactly what I told him. Do say, is that what Omer Hammer told you? So yeah. I didn't tell you like that. Call out Omer here. They went to get Omer Hammer. Omer Hammer came. As soon as they opened the door, he said, hello, Mr. Head of State. He said, did I tell you not to announce the result? Did I tell you to take it to Firestone Vault? I didn't tell you anything. Go let book had the result. So Hammer never said a word. And the result of the referendum was liberated from Firestone Vault. True story. Ask Mr. Nyemplu. He, oh, he did now, but you can't ask him. Ask Kroman. Kroman knows the story very well. Ask the other people, Cassilia Stewart and other people who are on the election commission. When that happened, shortly after that happened was a university crisis. There were students at the university who were protesting because little Onsoya got were put in jail. You remember? After all of this thing about the political party and this and that and the other, they found a way to put him behind bars. He and George Clay Kerr, I think, and some other people put him behind bars. There were students at the university who started to agitate for him to be free. Among them was a, a student, uh, Emmanuel Dolo, who is now Dr. Dolo. Uh, Dr. Dolo is a living witness. Will you please stand let it go see you? Stand up, young man. Thank you. That my living witness. Dr. Dolo then were carrying casket up and down on the university campus. Said that was dual casket. He was the main man behind this casket thing. He was a radical on campus. They did it for a few days. I think one or two days. And it aggravated the head of state. I was sitting in the Ministry of Information along with the Minister Al Haji Kroma when Do went over to the Capitol building and decided to have to address the PR, the, the Internet Assembly at that time. And we were shocked because the Information Ministry was not told that the head of state was going to address the people there. So we got glued to our TV, um, our radio, listening to what he was saying. And he said a lot of things. And at a certain point in time, he said, Mr. Defense Minister, Mr. Chief of Staff, you move to that campus and move those people. Then he said, move or be removed. And that's when the Chief of Staff and the Defense Minister moved to the university campus. And our video camera was there to videotape their entrance into the university and their progress as they entered the university campus itself. And as I said yesterday, the video was brought back to me because I insisted on interviewing everything before it's put on TV. And on that video was the defense minister walking on the left the chief of staff walking on the right with a back turned to the Capitol building. 
The chief of staff had his gun in his holster, walking with his two hands swinging. The defense minister, at the time the videographer videotaped him, was reloading his gun. There was no video footage of him firing the gun, but he was reloading the gun. So that video tip was brought to the Ministry of Information and given to me. Again, I telephoned Kumar to come to my room immediately because I was in charge of operations then. He came there, I showed him the video and showed him the people, re the defense minister reloading the gun and I said, this is trouble for us. I say in the first case is, I don't know much about military science. I did ROTC on BDI in the University of Liberia, but I don't know much. But in all my experience in military science, no one reloads of a gun who has not already discharged it. And no minister runs around with an empty gun. So for this man to reload a gun meant that he had unloaded it. So this is the PR problem we'll be having in the next few days. We have to gear ourselves up for this. Immediately we got through watching that video, we got a call from the defense ministry ordering the minister of information to send the assistant minister to the defense ministry and that was myself, along with the person who did a video recording on campus and along with the video cassette. We took the video cassette and the young man along with us to the defense ministry. We were ushered into the office of the defense minister. He said, where is that video that you all made at the university today? And I handed it to him. He called Rima Outland who was the assistant minister of defense for public affairs. He's the one who had a car in town that had on the license plate one wife. He's still alive. He handed a video to Rima Outland and told him to keep it. He said, where is the young man that videotaped this thing? We show him the young man. He said, okay. He gave a man a seat in his office and he turned to me and said, Mr. Minister, you may be dismissed. This video is a the property of the Joint Security. And as far as we are concerned, you have not seen or heard anything on this video. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir. And I left. That very afternoon, the young man reappeared in the Ministry of Information Yard, fully dressed in a military uniform, to announce to us that he no longer worked for the Ministry of Information but that he had been inducted into the armed forces of Liberia and assigned to the Public Affairs Bureau of the Ministry of National Defense. True story. That young man is in Liberia right now. All my witnesses, God has always been with me. That one, my name is Emmanuel, God with us. My witness, that videographer I'm telling you about, is in Liberia. And since I came home, I've been doing research on all the things that happened since I was in the government. Collecting my witnesses, talking to people, and I talked with him. He now works at a funeral home somewhere in the Republic of Liberia. At the appropriate time, I will carry members of the TRC or a representative to that funeral home, introduce you to the young man, and let him tell you his story. I will not tell you his name or where he works. I don't want anybody to destroy my evidence. So that was the university situation. The next day, I went back to work and briefed Mr. Kromar, the Minister of Information, and told him there was a need for the press to be taken on campus so as to verify all of the rumors we have heard of people being killed at the university. Based on my recommendation, Mr. Kromar went to the mansion and talked with Head of State Doe. Head of State Doe agreed that we should take the press to the campus. 
We took the foreign and the local press there in a vehicle, a truck. We didn't want them walking around too much. We put them in a truck and conveyed them around the university campus before we stopped the truck and allowed them to get down because the place was still manned by soldiers. And from the University of Liberia gate that faces the Temple of Justice, the, 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 um, the, the Capitol building, to the University of Liberia gate that faces um, the St. Patrick High School, there were panties from ladies and briefs from women and blouses and trousers all over the place with several pairs of shoes all over the place. Alexander Thompson from the BBC turned to me and said, Mr. Minister, we heard that some people died here. I said, yes, Alex, we all heard that. Now that you are here, help us to dig up the facts. And so we let the, free them to go and dig up the facts. Well, what has happened, what was bad publicity for us at that time is that when the foreign and local press arrived at the University of Liberia, accompanied by me, the soldiers were busy sweeping the university yard. They had turned into a voluntary corps to sweep out dike. I couldn't understand that. And with all the sweeping they did, we still saw panties and briefs and everything all over the place. So some, they, you could wonder what happened before they started sweeping. Alexander Thompson from the BBC turned to me and said, Mr. Boya, Doe has just crossed this bridge. He said, but we're, I'm coming back another time. And when I come back, it will not be water running under the bridge. It will be blood. Alexander from BBC told me that he's still alive. You can call the BBC and talk to him. All my witnesses just alive. These people refuse to die. <laughs> so, um, after that incident, A few days after that university incident, when I talked to people there and all, rumors started to circulate that I had come from America and that I had been influenced to come and mess with the image of the government here. And while that rumor was going around, I got a visit from Mr. Kroman, the Minister of Information, who came to my office as Assistant Minister of Information. He said, my man, I don't know what happened, but I got something to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, the head of state said that you should go back to America and uh, get your family. I said, but Kruman, you know very well, when they recalled me home, I told them to send the money, I'll bring my wife and children home. Now I'm here working as assistant minister. In the heat of all this referendum and all this thing, these things, how is it that I should go back? What I think I didn't end up was that Firestone situation. The referendum results were brought from Firestone vault and they were announced. And the referendum was overwhelmingly approved. The constitution was approved. So it was the effort of two persons at the universe, at the Ministry of Information, to help the government secure its own interest that caused the referendum to be approved. You can ask all the people on the, referen on the election commission. They are now all dead. So Kruman told me the head of state said you should leave. Go get your family. I told him, I said, Kruman, I've been here three months. I've not taken pay since you brought me here. May, June, July, this, August, I've not taken pay. How can I go to America empty-handed, say I come to get my family when I have not even taken pay here? So why don't they give me the money here for me to go and bring them? He said, the head of state says you should leave, they will send the money to you. I said, okay. But that okay meant that I will not go anywhere. Few days later, on, Kruman came back to me, my man, don't embarrass me. I said, what happened? He said, the man, 
were asking about you and the way he was asking about you, it looked like you were vexed. I told him that you were gone. So you got to leave. I said, okay, I will think about it. That same day, one of my friends who is now deceased, John Scotland, editor of the Sunday Express and all of that, Pentel Times, he came to me, he said, Buya, I said, yes. He said, I just left the mansion. They do not want you in town. Please leave. I said, but what did I do? He said, I don't know what you did, but you got to leave. He said, Pan American last flight is leaving Liberia on Wednesday, and I'm driving you to that airfield. You're leaving this town. Carry your big mouth with you. Then another of my friends called Joseph Sokba Morris, who was working in the mansion on a Talbot Endo, came to me and said, Buya, I said, yes. He said, this town is no place for gentlemen. He said, this is gangster's town. You cannot stay here, you gotta leave. So I decided to leave. And I said, how will my things here be secure because I'm renting a place? Who will take care of my place? They said, oh, the God will take care of it. The information ministry has shown me that everything will be taken care of. I said, okay. Scotland drove me into the airfield took the last Pan Am flight that ever came to Liberia. Flew out of here. When I was leaving, I got on the field and I met uh, somebody on the airfield that day. I think Tom you and I think Barkas Matthew or somebody. And I shook hands with them and left. Now, Bacchus, and he gave me a letter to take to Tom Woyu in America to say that they were having a rally there and Tom Woyu had to speak and Tipote had to speak. And he, Bacchus, didn't feel that he should be in America, he should be on the ground. So they should find somebody else to speak on his behalf. So I took the letter to America, deliver it to Tom Woyu. Woyu is still alive. My witnesses don't just die soon. So uh, I took it to you. When I arrived in Washington, D.C., I left Washington, D.C. because the opposition was having a demonstration against Doe. After staying here for about three or four months, when I arrived in Washington, D.C., there was an active rally going on against Doe. The next day was the rally after I arrived. The Ambassador at that time, George to Washington, um, uh, General Washington, said, well, we welcome me and said, let's go to the rally. We got to the rally. I handed Tom Woolley the letter from Bacchus Matthews. Tom opened the letter and read it to the group and said this letter was brought in by a do un assistant minister. I mean, and then... Tom turned to me and said, I told you, your boss I made you working for that crown dog, I will mess you up. So I, he said, I deliberately called and he let do here, yeah, he will mess with you. I told you to not to work for that crown dog. I swore you, he told me that. In the presence of everybody, including the ambassador. Then Dr. Tipote got up and said that, uh, talk about the university incident, and said that a lot of people died including Sandra Howard, who was known to be among, who was among the known dead. That was his, his words, those were his words. And so it came time for question and answer and they posed the question to me whether Sandra Howard had died in his university incident. And so I said, well, I'm not sure if Sandra Howard died. But I'm sure of one thing. There's a video of Sandra Howard after the university incident. And if people can say that it's the same Sandra Howard who died, then that's it. But I know there is a video, and I said we have it at the embassy. And people that did not rebut that statement. And as far as I know, Sandra Howard is now working with the Governance Commission today as I speak to you. So that PR stunt did not work. 
because Sandra O. Howard is very much alive. She works with Dr. Sawyer at the Governance Commission. I'm just telling you all the PR thing I went through because everything I did in this government and in other organizations had to do with public relations. And that is what I know best, public relations. So now, the day after tomorrow, War, you told the group that I had brought a letter from Bacchus Matthews to him or to the group and trying to imply that I was part of the setup because I brought a letter and telling me that he would mess me up began working for a crown dog. I got a, a fax from Minister Al Haji G V Kromal. He signed the fax as Major Al Haji G V Kromal Armed Forces of Liberia. I still have a copy of that fax among my papers in the United States. That's why I wanted to negotiate with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to let me bring some of those papers home before you call me here because I like to show people when I talk. But I'm sure Kruman should have a copy of that uh, fax. Call him and let him verify. The facts were very simple. By directive of the head of state and um, Chairman of the People Redemption Council and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of Liberia. You are hereby reassigned to the Embassy of Liberia, United States of America, as press and cultural counselor, period. You are hereby advised that because of the situation, prevailing situation, you remain in the United States while arrangements will be made to ship your things to you. Period. You are not to return to Morovia. Kruma is alive. Ask him. He didn't do anything bad to me. He was just telling me what the head of state had told him to do. So you see, after they have gone through all of the situation, they trace the fact that the referendum did not die. They trace the fact that the referendum result could not remain in Firestone vaults. And they trace all to me. So I became the troublemaker who were put in exile. Mr. John Molu works for the government of Liberia as ambassador at large or something like that right now. He was formerly with the um, Maritime Bureau. I want you to ask Mr. Molu. At the time that I was told to stay in the United States and not to return to Liberia, the government of Liberia had signed a contract with Ecuban and Sons, a Nigerian company in the Washington, D.C. area, to rent a four-room townhouse for me because all press and cultural counselors before me, including D minus Claire Williams and other people, live in homes. I was the first press counselor to be put in a two-room apartment. And so they, I complained and protested in the government. I was put in that apartment because I was talking too much book and they wanted me to send me in exile. So they cut off the educational allowance for my children. They cut off the housing and put me in a two-room apartment from 1983 to 85. While arrangements were being made for me to get a house because I was continuously protesting when I returned to Washington, D.C., Mr. Molo received a telex and contact Mr. Molo, he will tell you he's alive. He received a telex telling him to cancel the agreement with a Cuban and company. They no longer were interested in renting a place for me. I should stay in a two-room apartment. When in fact the government had paid more than $5,000 in advance for the place I was supposed to stay and the contract stated that if the government forfeited in occupying the place, the people would take the money. The government said, let the people take the money, we're not renting no place for him. And that is how I went back to Washington, D.C., 1984. 
I was in Washington, D.C. 1984. I remained there until 85 when the invasion happened in Liberia. It was at that time, the Kuomba invasion, it was at that time that there was suspicion. But before I go on to that, let me say this. When I returned to Washington, D.C., I took along with me that videotape that General Jeffrey Batu had made canceling the referendum. Mr. Jackson E. Doe, who is now Minister of Transport, was then in school in California. I called him up and said, I have an interesting video to show you because of the way your people are treating me. They assume that I'm against them. But I will send you the video that they made to cancel the referendum, which you have burned brought trouble to Liberia. So you can know that I was not against anybody. I just like to speak the truth. So I sent that video to Mr. Jackson Doe. Jackson E. Doe of Grand Gita. He's now Minister of Transport. Until this day, I'm sure he's still keeping it because he never returned it to me. So could the TRC please retrieve it from him? 1985, there were rumors and counter rumors. I was in the uh, Maryland area and there were rumors that General Kuangba was in some uh, seminary or somewhere studying the Bible. He wanted to become a religious person. And after that, there were other rumors that some people, some powerful invisible hands were trying to tell him that he got to come back and liberate his people. And there were, plan there were rumors that they were making plans to come back to do that. It was during that time that some people had a meeting in New Jersey, in the United States of America, to draw up a plan to bring down the Doe's government. I attended that program as the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs because I felt it was my professional duty to go to all of these programs, recall them and uh, bring documents from them and inform the government because that was the public affairs supposed to do. They had the NSA to do their duty, I was there to do my duty. And I must tell you that I did not send lies to the government or anybody. And that is why I have called on the public to please confront me now before this TRC period is over with all the mess that I did, all the nonsense I did in government, bring it forward, let's discuss it. I will not get vexed with you. I will not curse you out. I will not sue you. I will just explain to you. When I explain to you, you will get sorry for yourself. So um, I went to that program. That program was attended by Liberians and some Lebanese. Liberians and some Lebanese. They were at that program. And at that program was Dr. Patrick Sayon, former president of the University of Liberia. Dr. Mary Antoinette Brown Sherman, former president of the University of Liberia, and other people in New Jersey, United States of America. Patrick Sayon and Mary Antoinette Brown made statements. And as I told you yesterday, I tried to, I, I don't know much, I went to the Columbia School of Broadcasting, I don't know much, but I tried to be a, a good journalist, I try. And a good journalist, I want to tell the younger people, is one who keeps his notes. A journal is a notebook or a compilation of sheets, a journal. Or you can even keep it on uh, animal skin, once you keep it, it's a journal. You do not go and copy, you do not go and cover the inauguration of the president in 2006. January 16, and if I ask you for your notes today, you can't find it because some grumpy woman has already wrapped grumpies in it. 
I want to send this note forward to the commissioner so they can look at it and see the age of the paper so they can know I'm not making things up. When I read it, I will send it to you. It's dated November 29, 1986. These are my notes on New Jersey when they were having the program to say they wanted to come and unseat the Doe government. November 29, 1986. Booyah keeps old papers. That one, I'm not afraid for the rogue to come steal. They would, just, they would get discouraged and go back. All papers are all you'll find. Dr. Sion said, there is a lack of a sense of urgency among Liberians. There is a lack of a sense of urgency among Liberians. He said that he had a heavy burden of individual guilt for what had happened to Liberia. Because they agitated against the Torba government and they thought something better was coming and it became worse. And he had a heavy burden of individual guilt. He went on to say, we have run out of time. We have borrowed time and that borrowed time has ran out. Unless we act now, people would laugh at us. He said, in nine, uh, Dr. Sherman said, in 1980, Dr. Sherman was called the mother. He, he said, he uh, so young was saying, in, in 1980, Dr. Mary Antoinette Brown Sherman was called the mother of the revolution. He said, that revolution has not died, but it, is, it has not been realized yet. There is social injustice. There is no progress. Let me be looking at it first. See why I read it second. Then we turn on to page two. Dr. Sherman. Dr. Sherman said the hands of time has been turned back in Liberia for almost six years. She said this has threatened the national fabric and led to decay. She said, people's hope for a new day has been dashed. She said, people were, were led to believe that the problems were based on ethnicity and tribalism. And when the tribal people took over, they would be solved. And she said, how wrong. She said, what has happened to the cause of the people? She asked that question. What has happened to the cause of the people? What is the cause of the people anyway? She asked. People who today ride a train benefited from the scholarship of previous governments. That's what Dr. Sherman said. Please take this. People who benefited who riding the gravy train today were part of the government scholarship from long ago. Got PhD, DD, and all kind of Ds. She said unity should be our common national goal. Respect for the rule of law, freedom of speech and movements. Then she lamented that external influences have negatively affected Liberia. Then she talked about the 1843 census. Less than 43% of Liberian, Liberian could read or write, etc., etc. Those are my notes, my journalistic notes. I compiled those notes and send my report to the news agency and to the press secretary to the head of state. I'm just saying, I hope those notes will come back to me now because I've been keeping them for a long time. I, I don't distrust you, but don't give it to the press until you send it back to me. Let them come to me for it because I want to photocopy it before I give it to them. Because these press guys, I love them. But I don't know whether they keep notes, though I don't like them. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> what I'm telling you here is that as Minister of Council of Public Affairs, as someone who has worked in Washington, D.C. and hold, held membership in the National Press Club of Washington, D.C., I was not going to Washington, D.C. to just send all kind of foolishness back here to make somebody feel good so I can stay on some job. That was not my aim. I tried to do a professional job. And may I inform you, and I hope the commission will excuse me if I look at the audience now. May I inform you that Buya is not a coward. Buya is not a dumb boy. And Buya is not a liar. About three months or out of three or four months ago, I had the occasion to visit the foreign ministry and I met with President Salif and I presented her with about out of four or five pages of a document that I composed in 19, November 11, 1986 covering her opposition activities against the Doe government in Washington DC and I took it to her and said that you just inaugurated the TRC and you call on all of us to start telling the truth and revealing things so I brought one truth to you and that is the report I made on you and I gave her her copy and I sat there and she read a few paragraphs and she smiled she said you got all this I said yes and much more <laughs> you see what I'm telling you here is you can do a professional job as a security officer, as a press correspondent, as minister counselor for public affairs. You can report on activities of the opposition without demonizing the opposition. And I sat that pace long ago when I had no need to do it. I know of press counselors who have sent messages to Liberia that caused a foreign minister to be dismissed the next day because I was in the Ministry of Information. I know of press reports that came from there that caused some people to go to Belayala. And when I became press counselor, I decided that I would not do the same. Why? Because when my children were going to school and I have two girls who were born in the United States, they have not seen Liberia, not because they don't want to come here or I don't want to bring them here, but they were born during war season and it had not been civilized enough to bring them back. I had three children here, two in America. So these little girls would go to school and come back and they want to share with their daddy what they learned in school. And one of them called Joyce, who is now going to get a master's degree in television broadcasting from Howard University. Her American friends call her motor mouth because she talks too much. And she came to me, Daddy, I want to teach you a song. I said, what's that? Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber's waves of green, and all kind of things. She started to tell me I had to learn some American song, old man like me. So then she got to a point where she said, Oh, beautiful for Petra's dream that sees beyond the years. And even though she was a little girl repeating that, that line caught my attention. Oh, beautiful for Petra's dream that sees beyond the years. That was when that girl was about five years old. She now going to graduate from Howard with a bachelor's in television broadcasting. I copied that down and I kept it. When I did anything, I remember that I should have a picture's dream that sees beyond the years. So that in 1985, I could see beyond the years that there would be 2008 when I would be confronted with all that I did. And so I behaved myself. And you 2008 people don't think that when I bring you back here, you have to account for what you are doing. Oh, beautiful for Petra's dream that sees beyond the years. 85, I was in the United States. There were rumors that a strong man was coming to liberate the people. 
our press counselor. The intelligence in Liberia pick up the story. And there's one thing I must say for the intelligence community here. We have had liars, yes, in the security, that's true. We have had people who use the security to make money, that's true. But for the most part, the security of the uh, Republic of Liberia has been very, very vigilant. And I'm telling you because in Liberia they say kuku jumuku. You're not inside, you don't know. I have been inside from five years old. And I know. I know more than some people who are sitting on the house top. The security has been very vigilant. The security might have traced the fact that the strong man was preparing to return. And so the news was sent from the national security or from the joint security to the foreign ministry that certain members of the embassy staff were involved in the plot to execute the invasion. And Ambassador George Stowe Washington instituted an investigation. And one member of the staff were accused of that and you know as much as I said the PRC boys were dumb they were not very dumb after all it was not until the PRC came to power that we had a security attaché to any embassy in the world so the security attaché in Washington DC who was seconded there by the special security service pick up the pieces and it was found out that one member of the embassy staff had engineered the falsification of some documents to have the strong man pass and come to Liberia. Those documents were taken to the Avorian embassy and they were processed. But they were not processed in the name of Thomas Kwiwongba. They were processed in the name of Thomas Bogoma, which was in fact his middle name, Thomas G. Kwiwongba. The, 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 the officer at the embassy denied it, and he was dismissed anyway. And we all felt sorry for him, say, oh, they lie on Eric Scott. But you were here the other day when somebody came to this very podium and said that, that Eric Scott called them and said the general is about to undertake something in Liberia and the general wants to talk to you. So whatever was hidden in 1985 hit the house top in 2008 when it was confirmed, confirmed that Eric Scott was indeed there. It means that the special security officer, Kawa, who dug up the whole thing, Edward Kawa, was not lying. We have downplayed our security people in this country so much that they look like little boys. I know very well that there were some big people just going to the president, scaring the president to get money. But the security people in the field are professional people. And I hope the people now will listen to them. Don't just dismiss everything. I know they got some gangsters among them. But sift the information, it will save you a lot of headache. So they prepared to inv the invasion. They got their, 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 their documents passed to the Ivory Coast and they came to Liberia. On November 12, 1985, I was still at the Embassy of Liberia in Washington, D.C. when they hit Monrovia. And so I was not here physically to be able to tell you what I saw. It was that November 12th when Charles Boyan was killed 
it was that November 12th when one of my friends in the NSA, Amadou V. Salif, A. V. Salif, was killed. It was that November 12th that many persons were killed. Even though I was not here, I launched an investigative report to find out what happened. Why did it happen? How did it go down that way? How come the head of state do or President do at that time? Because by the time he was elected, he was he had not been elected. Yes. How come he could escape? And what did my investigation find out? And my investigation came from dispatches from the Liberian News Agency video cassette recording of the invasion that was sent to the embassy of Liberia by the government of Liberia, accounts from opposition leaders in the United States at that time, accounts for the Loyal Com Committee on Human Rights that wrote the book called uh, uh, Something Betrayed, A Promise Betrayed, etc., etc., etc. I encourage all of our young journalists when something happens, don't just put in the hairline tomorrow morning, everybody go back to the Hatai shop and to the drinking booth and just drink and don't talk. Follow it up. When will my paper come back to me? Please, please, I, 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 I hope you excuse me, but I like to keep those papers. I mean, I've been keeping them for a long time. And my children will not forgive me if I don't show it to them. What I'm saying is journalists must learn to investigate no matter how long it takes. And since a lot of people have talked a lot of things over the years about what happened in Liberia, without giving the thank you very much, without giving the inside story, since history has just messed with me by allowing me to be in everything that happened in this place in 1970. You know there's a lady in this town, everybody go in the corner and talk about her. You know, she being everything in this country. She being everything in this country. Well, I just want to confess to you that I've been in everything in this country. I have been in everything in this country actively since 1970. That is why I told the chairman of this commission a few months ago that he would have to call me here or I would come here. How can you leave me out of this thing? I've been in everything since 1970. Nothing important that happened here that I can't tell you about. So that's why I'm here. I'm not here because I work for Doe or I will hear Minister Information. Again, another correction to make. During those 10 years of head of state and president of Liberia, in 10 years, Doe had seven ministers of information. Do you know that? No, you don't know. Everybody think that Buya was Doe Minister of Information for 10 years. No, that's not true. Buya came in 1987, three years before the fall. I came in on a damage control mission. For seven years, the damage was done. I was called in to control the damage. Now you left me with a, with a bag, and now everybody thinks I'm the man. I'm the criminal. I did everything. Those first minutes of information should have been, I say should have been, Mr. Major Tommy Reigns. When the coup occurred, we were looking for Tommy Reigns to be the minister because he was a soldier boy in the army. Tommy Reigns had gone to commentate the game between the Lone Star and another team and the, the presidential jet plane had taken them out of this country. And so Tommy Reigns did not become minister because when they got to the radio station they met Gabriel Nimlin. So by fortune, by luck, by blessing, Gabriel Nimlin became the minister of information. Gabriel Nimlin was succeeded by Gray D. Allison. Gray D. Allison was succeeded by Peter Nyangao. Peter Nyangao was succeeded by Alhaji Kroma. Alhaji Kroma was succeeded by Carlton Kape. Carlton Kape was succeeded by Momolu Getawe. 
It was after that that they brought me in for damage control. And I came in March 1987. The invasion was over. The Nima Ray were over. The executions were over. All these damages have been done when they brought Buya in for damage control. Why? Because I'm a damage control man. When things fall, call me. I can put it back together. So I just want to make that clear. Now, certain things we need to clarify. And as I said, I needed some time because I'm just telling you now about the time I was press counselor. I was press counselor. I was assistant minister. I was uh, secretary, I mean, uh, general coordinator of the Chui Party. I was minister of information. So all these things, everyone ain't got their own history. And a lot of things happen all the time. That's why I hope you don't think I'm, I'm wasting your time because me, if you just want me to talk about one position, I will talk about it and leave it, but I will not jump all around. We got to go through the thing step by step. And for you who still want to hear the story, you can arrange after the ETRC hearing, we can go on a beach, we can go to some Hatai shop or somewhere, and we can continue to talk. But I will have to talk it step by step. The invasion, I came home to find out what was happening. The invasion occurred in 1985. I was made Minister of Information in 1987. Why was I made Minister of Information? After the same government sent me into exile. I was there when everything went apart. December 1986, the entire embassy staff was paid, asked Mr. John Molu, who is now ambassador. He was in charge of finances at the place. The entire embassy staff was paid, including everybody that worked under me except myself. If I'm lying, ask Mr. John Molu. No money came for me. Mother Agnes Gibson Doe, the founder, she's dead now, the founder of the Little White Chapel by the wayside in Logan Town was then in the United States. I was in her church at that time. I was associating with her and I was in the choir. Even though I was a diplomat, no. I was in the choir singing. Mother Agnes Gibson Doe had to launch a fun drive to buy food for me and my family December 1986 and to buy toys for my children because the government was owing me six months and refused to pay me for Christmas because everybody had this mistaken notion that I was just a bad boy and I needed some punishment. Somebody got a radio on that gave me a feedback on who you put it off. I'm a radio man myself. Put it off. Um, Minister Getaway was then engaged to a lady. And he was supposed to get married to this lady. He sent his controller, E.K. Davis, to the United States around that time to buy some materials for the wedding. When he got there, I told E.K. Davis that you people have not paid me for about six months. You have come with thousands of dollars to shop for the minister. Will you please just pay me for one month so I will be able to help my children? He said, no, I cannot do it unless you tell the minister. I said, okay. I pick up the telephone in front of him and I call Minister Gatawe. And I explain my situation to Minister Gatawe. And he said, put E.K. on. I put E.K. on and he told E.K. something on the telephone which I didn't hear. But E.K. told him, Mr. Minister, I can't do that. Then the, 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 with the account will have to be closed. The man will have to wait until I come to Maria will process the money. And he put the telephone down. And so Mother Doe had to give me food for Christmas and buy toys for my children. While I was still issuing all kind of press releases defending the government and talking big talk. 
that's another bad thing my father made me do. He said, no matter what happened, when you make a bad bargain, you stick to it. Never talk against the system you work for when you are in the system. Do your best. And so I was there defending the system. And the system was starving me for six months in the United States without. Every sheriff in Montgomery County knows my name. Because they had come to my place several times to evict me from the apartment. The last time they came, one guy called Nathaniel Bromskin working with us at the embassy had to credit me $500 to keep them from throwing my things in the snow when my wife was eight months pregnant expecting my late daughter that we now call Faith who is studying psychology and education at Montgomery College. We all have had our bad news with governments. But I'm happy that my father told me, boy, never you fight against the government. Work from inside. If he had not told me so, you would be in trouble a long time. Well, my strategies, if I really decide to do something, it will happen. But I thank God for my father who told me when you make a bad bargain, you stick to it. That is why I've never denied being a member of the True Party. No matter what you say about the party, I was the last general coordinator of the True Party and I can stand on top of the world and say so. Because my record in that party is clear. Two o'clock in the day, two o'clock, not in the night, two o'clock in the day, I drove the True Party Jeep TWB5 to Bagos Matthews Party Headquarters on Gurley Street to pay courtesy call on him as general coordinator of the True Party. Kankala was there. Bagos Matthews gave me a stack of documents from his party. I still have them. I'm sorry the man not here. He said you are going to drag me to the PRS, TRC. I told him you don't have to drag me. I'm coming there. And we had a, a, an exchange on... Um, Abraham Col Aaron College Radio. Go and listen to that exchange. Very cordial exchange. He told us how, why he went to the mansion and I told him why he went there. I will come to that point. Everybody wanted to say there was a right wing coup. That's good. But was that a real reason why they went there? We'll talk that. I'm just telling you that we all as young people go through problems. I'm telling you this because you will never find what I'm telling you in any textbook. No matter how much PhD you get, you will not get what I'm telling you here. So you listen to older people. I was victimized by the system several times, starting with my father. But I never learned to be a bitter person. Bitterness will not take you anywhere. If you can wait, this is the day that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and never faint. Just wait. When I went to the Universal Library in 1970 and opened the first book in the library, I read something that I never forgot. It was a quotation from Montresa. A thousand candles burn themselves out. Still I read on. Just keep cool long enough. All these people will burn themselves out. A thousand candles burn themselves out. Still I read on. December 1976, the Embassy of Liberia had a Christmas party. Because I was the press and cultural counselor, I was called to play. Uh, 86, 86, 86, not 76, 86, December 86. Because I was the press and cultural counselor, I was told that my duty was to play music. They had not paid me for six months. Everybody got their pay, had bought up their Christmas things, yet I was supposed to play music. So I talked to my wife, she got angry, I'm, maybe because you're pregnant, she's quick to get angry. But I said, look, you know what happened? 
you get in dress and I'm taking my sound system, we'll play music and I will dance with you. The six more would not kill me. So we went to the dance. I played the music the whole night, me and my wife dance. While that was happening, Mr. Senator Edward Kennedy opened up his mouth on Liberia. The Liberian government is corrupt and will stop aid to Liberia and will do this and will do that. There's a guy called Kendall Wills from the New York Times. He called me up. We're friends. You know, we're all in the press call. Uh, Emmanuel, you heard what Senator Kennedy said? What do you have to do about it? He said that was a Friday evening. I was very, very angry. I was angry with the Liberian government for not paying me for six months. But there's something in psychology called transferred aggression or displaced aggression. You can be f angry with your boss man, but you can't talk it because your boss man will fire you. So you go home and you beat up your wife. That displaced aggression. So I have therapists off with the Liberian government for not paying me for six months. Then Canada opened his mouth on us. Oh, I saw as a Kendall, you know what happened? Call me tomorrow, Saturday morning. I will give you an interview. Any question you want to ask me, ask me. I will answer you. That was a New York Times. Kendall Wills, he's still around. Ask K-E-N-D-E-L-L-W-I-L-L-S. Call him. So he put me on. I said, now, Kendall, ask me as straightforward. I'll answer you straightforward. He said, what do you make of what Kennedy said? I said, look, Kendall, tell Kennedy I say Liberia is not a warehouse. We are not on his farm. He's not a we are not a warehouse. He cannot shut us down and close down the country. And if there's something between here and Doe, they should IA out at their level. But the people of Liberia and the people of America will always be friends whether Doe is alive or dead, whether Kennedy is alive or dead. Tell him I say so. Interview over. That became a headline in the New York Times. It was sent to Liberia. When Doe saw it, he panicked. In his thinking, he assumed that the United States government would get at me for that statement. Just in that time, he sent Senator Ramsey, Minister Ketawe, and some other people to the United States to negotiate for something. And I was still the press counselor when that statement was made. While they were there, the VOA called me and said, we want you to arrange for your minister to come and have a press conference with us tomorrow. I said, okay, at 4 o'clock. I arranged for the press conference. That same time, my wife delivered March 1. 1986 and no 87 March 1 1987 I could not be at the hospital with her because I was with a delegation and my wife got angry but I told her to consider no I was going to be with her for the rest of the time so I got to be with these people who didn't pay me I had to show them good faith, so maybe they would feel sorry and pay me. So while I was at the Capitol building with these people, when I came back to the embassy, there was a guy working at the embassy called Boima Fambule. Not this Boima Fambule. There are about three or four Boima Fambules. He was formerly special assistant to Cecil Dennis before the coup. When I was walking toward the embassy building, he came rushing outside and he greeted me. Congratulations, Mr. Minister. I said, so, who are you talking to? He said, you're the new minister of information. I said, what do you mean by that? He showed me the telex. The head of state had been pleased to make the following appointment. Emmanuel Buya, minister of information, culture and tourism with immediate effect. And Minister Gitawa was my guest in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and I was the press counselor carrying him around, making his appointments. I came to conclude with the VOA. And do announcing back here that I have replaced the man. Man, that was worse than my six month salary. <laughs> that was, I, I want to tell you what happened inside for you who don't know and you think that some of us were just stooges. What we went through, the mental agony. I had not been paid for six months, that was good enough. 
But for the minister to be visiting, I'm carrying him around. I've just made an appointment for him to go to the VOA. Time for us to go to VOA. A telex come to say the man in Washington, D.C. have been dismissed while he was in Washington, D.C. And I, the man messenger, now become the minister. That's how I became minister. So I went into the office and people said when something happens you can become paralyzed. It's true. About four o'clock, I sat in my chair in my office and I couldn't get up. By seven o'clock, I composed myself enough to call my wife and to tell her that according to the telex just sent, I'm supposed to be the new minister. She said, what kind of minister did you pay her yet? I said, yeah, but that's what it said. And do you know I could not get out of that chair from 4 o'clock until about 8.30 in the night. Everybody went home. I was still sitting in that chair. I wanted to leave. I couldn't leave. I was just there. I was crying and crying and crying. I don't know why I was crying. Because here the people, they need some me money for Christmas. And it made me minister while Getaway were in town. I said, what? I said, well, I didn't undermine this guy. I didn't do anything. So I composed myself. By 9 o'clock, I had the courage to go home to my wife. The VOA called me up to tell me that they were having an interview with me the next morning. I told them Getaway was the one I arranged the interview for. They told me as far as they were concerned, Getaway is not the Minister of Information. I'm the Minister of Information. I told them as far as I'm concerned, I have not been commissioned. I will not have any interview. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have an interview. The next morning, I did not know how to approach Dr. Getaway. They were in the hotel. I went there and said, good morning. As soon as I said good morning, Senator Ransom opened up on me. I know what, what, what I don't, they nonsense do doing. I got to hurry up and get back home. All kind of pistol little boys he, he bring to the cabinet now. Irresponsible boys. I mean, he started calling me. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't, Joe didn't call me. He didn't talk with me. He didn't say anything to me. So then I went and shook. Minister Gatawa's hand. He shook my hand and his eyes were full of tears. He turned and was looking outside. It was March and there was still some snow around. And he put his two hands in his pockets. He looked outside of the hotel room, State Plaza Hotel, across the road. And he started to whistle a song that I knew very well. And I felt bad and I wanted to cry. And the song said, My God, my father, why I stray? Far from that side, in all my ways. Oh, teach me from thy heart to say, Thy will be done. When that man was whistling that song, I felt bad. I had not undermined him. I said nothing against him. I had served him well. In fact, I got a telex from him when I had an interview at Howard University with Mr. Salif. I got a telex from him congratulating him for doing the best I could do under the condition that I had to operate. Mr. Salif is a good debater. And we had a very heated debate. I still got a cassette here. I haven't given her a copy yet. I think she should have her copy because the radio station gave us copy. That man, I mean, that's when I saw that government can destroy friendship. They just appointed me while the man was still visiting me. And he started to say, my God, my father, why I stray far from thy side in all my ways. Oh, teach me from that my heart to say thy will be done. The whole trip was bad. They left. I got a telex telling me to report to Monrovia immediately for confirmation. And so in March 1987, 
I was appointed Minister of Information. I didn't undermine anyone. I didn't send any false report on anyone. And all the reports I sent can be found in the files of the press secretary to the president, Mr. Patrick Kuma, in the executive mansion. Get Mr. Valentine to take you through them. You have to see beyond the years. You who send any reports now, know that in the year 2050, somebody will be reading those reports. Don't let those reports embarrass your children. Talk the truth. I arrived in Monrovia. But before I arrived in Monrovia, I got a call from people in Monrovia telling me to be very careful how I come to take over the Ministry of Information. Because there were plans to make sure that I do not survive the first three months. That I will be physically eliminated by any means possible. And that was the best thing I've heard. For those who don't know me, the worst thing to do to me is to threaten me. When you threaten me, I get so stubborn you would think I'm a rock. So they came back the report that somebody had brought in the night a casket and placed it where the minister car should park and they had performed some ritual around that casket and had taken it out of the yard. And I arrived and they appointed a day for me to take over. Well, you know, I usually make fun. So I went to the taking over ceremony, and when they got through talking, Minister Getaway talked, everybody talked, it was time for me to take over. I called up Mr. E.K. Davis, who was still the financial controller. I said, you know, in Liberia, when something happened, people like to revenge. I said, Mr. E.K. Davis, please stand, and he stood up. And you can ask all the people who were there, they're still in the ministry today. I said, ladies and gentlemen, when ministers take over, they usually bring in new people. I have no new people to bring in. But I just want to do one thing. I want to confirm now that I hereby reappoint Mr. E.K. Davis as the controller in this ministry. And I recounted how he went to Washington, D.C. when my wife was pregnant. He refused to help her. He refused to do this. But I will not hold it against him because I do not have the hands of revenge. And E.K. Davis started to cry. But that is the way to be a good leader. When, you are, when God carry you above the people who mess you up, don't go back down and try to sit on their head. God has fought your battle. Leave them alone. If there's anything you can do, help them. And God will continue to lift you up. When God has made you the leader, don't listen to people who bring you all kind of foolishness and tell you that security briefings and all kind of briefings and this briefing about this person, these people don't like you, that person doesn't like you. When God raises you up, who can be against you? That's what I call leadership. I told E.K. I said, you confirm in your position. But I said, you know what happened, E.K.? You know you're my friend. We used to call each other the heat. I said, you're my friend, E.K. We've been hanging out Mamba Point long before the coup. I just want to tell you something. You, you confirm, you reaffirm, but don't make any mistake here because the least mistake, I'll fire you. I'll put you a warning. Because any mistake now, that means you want to sabotage me. Then I said to the group, Minister Gatawe, I want to take over today, but I refuse to take over because there's unfinished business here. He said, Buya, what is that unfinished business? I said, you got a dead body here. You haven't buried yet, and you call Basa man and me to take over when they're dead body in town, and you know we let dead body business? He said, what do you mean by that? I said, oh, didn't somebody bring a casket here and put it to the place where my car's was back? That means there's a body to be buried. And I'm not that body. 
So until we can bury that dead body, I refuse to take over. We sit in this room until you bring that body. I sat down. When I want to get stubborn, I get stubborn. And then I got up again. I said, look, I'm not joking. Nobody will leave this room until you produce a dead body. If you think you are scaring me by bringing a casket in this yard and putting it where the cars will park, I'm a boss of man. I like dead body. I want my dead body. So my people can come and scare us and matter. We start beating drum and eating our dumb up. Then Jessica Lee rose up quietly. Said, Mr. Minister, I said, yes, Minister, Assistant Minister Conley. He said, I'm sorry, I apologize. I didn't mean any harm. We're bringing a casket from the Cinco area. When we got on the, to the Capitol building on the Capitol bypass, the glass on top of the casket started to shake. So I thought of bringing a yard to adjust it. When we got to adjusting it, we took it to bombing where we were carrying. I said, Jesse, I like to hear that, but do you know that when the casket glass start to shake, you go and stop on the sidewalk and just fix it right in the pickup? Did you have to drive it into this yard, take it out of the pickup, and put it on the ground where the minister car parks? I said, Jesse, you don't know me. You don't know me. I didn't just come. God told the church of the Lord, Aladura, that I will be born and my name will be Emmanuel. God with us. Don't mess with me, Jesse. I forgive you. We'll work together. Now I will take over. I'm just telling you that in Liberia, all kinds of funny things happen. And I started working in the Ministry of Information. The first pronouncement I made as Minister of Information, check the Observer and all those newspapers, was that I did not come to Liberia to polish the personal image of any individual whatsoever. First announcement. I came to defend the image of the government, but not individual images. If there was something happening with the government image, I would defend the government image. But as a private person, you go out and mess up and think that Buya is a clean-up man, you are lying. I will watch you get messed up. Second announcement. That no government official in this Republic of Liberia had the right to tell the press no comment. When something happens and the press comes, explain what happened. Do not say no comment because it's a dumb comment. By saying no comment, people assume that you're hiding something. And the best way to handle that is for ministers not to open their mouths and start talking first. When something happens, let the public affairs person in your ministry speak. After that, your director should speak. After that, your assistant minister should speak. After that, your deputy minister should speak. And then when it comes to you, you have the common sense to know what to say because you have sufficiently studied the situation. But you got some microphone ministers that love to just jump on because the headline will say, this minister was speaking today, that minister. I told them, every minister, shut up if you got nothing to say. But do not say no comment. I didn't come here serving anybody personal purpose. After three months, President Doe went to the Ministry of Information one afternoon unannounced into my office to congratulate me for what he said was his impression about the way I ran the ministry. During that three months, I had already told President Doe that he will no longer be a radio broadcaster. That I, as Minister of Information, will be the spokesperson of the government of Liberia. And when something happens, I will speak for the government, and other ministers will speak, and then the president will be the last to speak. Because the president is not a radio broadcaster. Soon something happens, you run the president to the front. The president might go talk to the market people. The president might go talk to the Yana boy, to the wheelbarrow boy, to the, to the people who, who, who sell snails and, and ground peas. Where are the other officials? The president should be protected so that 
when the person speaks is final because everybody else has spoken you can have this person say one thing and another minister come and say something that sounds better and then the government has to cope with the last statement because it sounds better whenever you rush original matters to the president you you trap the president so i told do for now on you are no longer a broadcaster every day do say this do say that said no 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 Buya will say because i am the spokesperson not you when you want a press conference you tell me what it is all about i will arrange it but i will speak for you you will no longer be a radio broadcaster so he came to thank me the next week some people went to him and said they sent a parma chief to him no they usually use these indigenous leaders the man went to him and said Mr. President, he said, he said well, I want to find out one thing I hear. He said, Booyah, that a new name for the president? So do so what do you mean by that? So what we can't hear you this time. Anything the government wants to say, Booyah say, Booyah say, Booyah say, we can't hear you this time. So Booyah that a new name for president. Do grab his microphone back. He took his microphone back. And he started making pronouncements. Like one of the very bad ones he made when he announced that if the people in Nima don't start fighting, he'll just bomb them. I went to the mansion and said, Mr. President, how can you say this? How can you announce that if the people of Nima don't stop, you'll bomb them? You ever heard of a leader, a leader announcing to the world that you're going to bomb his people? I said, that's bad. Now, what do you expect me to say when Robin White calls me on Focus on Africa? He said, go take the thief on the radio. <laughs> I said, but the people finna hear it. He said, I said, go take it off. So by that time, Alhaji Kumar was director general. You can ask him. I call him on the radio. And his, 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 his code name was Fire, Fire Point. As a fire point, this is fortress, fortress, eliminate announcement for the mansion over and out. I was finished with that. It never been heard since that day. But the people have heard it already. I'm just telling you that in government business, you got all kinds of situations. So I'm explaining this to you to tell you where we got, how we got, where we got. Then came the situation where the Nima raid had passed in 1985, but tension was still brewing. They were still brewing, and Doe decided, and all of the counties were bringing petition to Doe. You no, know, Topman style. Topman is the man we want. We don't want nobody else. So all the people say. We sang that for 27 years. When the man died, we said never again. So, um, they were bringing petitions. So I remember Maryland County came with a petition that was read by Wilma Stubberfield, an announcer at ELBS. And Doe said that day, because of what we were reading in that petition, it was so moving. Doe said, look, I have decided I need to make up with my people. I need to make up with the people of Nima County. We are one people. It was bad that my friend Thomas came here and the people fooled him and he had to die. I'm sorry. We need to make up. So we arranged a peace conference in San Nicole. That was 1987, about November. So I was assigned to the team to arrange the press conference. I mean, the, the peace talk. Edward Saka was assigned to it, and other people were assigned to it. We went ahead to lay the groundwork for the peace talk. I assumed that the peace talk would be done in a traditional sense because Samia Doe were from the traditional background, Jackson Doe were from traditional background, Nima County is a traditional people, Grand Jita people were all traditional people. But you always got somebody who talk about the security implications. The security people came and said, we cannot have the peace talk anywhere except in the city hall 
or in the administrative building and we can't carry it in the bush where we're supposed to have it on the road. So, okay. Because if you carry it there and something happened, they will come grab all of us and say we knew the plan. So we agree we have it in the city hall. So what would be the pattern? Will we just be all on the same level or what will it be? We map all that out. Samia Do, Jackson Do will all be seated on the same platform as equals because in our president and former senator is Jackson Doe representing the Nima people, Samuel Doe representing the Grand Jeter people, we'll all be together, we we'll have this peace talk. We we'll move up there. By the time we got there, and Doe drove from Morovia to San Nicole, the plan changed. When we got there, Mr. Jackson, Senator Jackson Doe, former senator arrived, they sat him down among the audience. President Doe arrived, we stood up, they played the national anthem, they sat him up on the stage. All oh, he bought a guy behind him, Jackson Doe, there were hit people behind him. I went to Dr. Guanu, and my witness again, Guanu is alive. I went to Dr. Guanu, I said, what I see here will not work. He said, why? I said, how can we come to negotiate between Nimba and Grand Chita? And they are now on the same level. Why is the president seated up there and Jackson Doe is seated down there? This will not work. It should be where they are equals. They're coming to negotiate on behalf of their people. It's not the president of Liberia coming to negotiate with a former senator. And even in that case, they should be on the same level. He said, yeah, but you know, they would have the people doing it, no. And Guanu had his own problem with the Doe government and they removed him from Washington, D.C. and all of that. So. And I work under Dr. Guano in Washington. That's why I could talk to him openly. Then the first day, it was an open meeting where everybody was there. Then the second day, they said, well, we're going to the real talks. And there were people from Grand Jeter who felt that nobody who is not from Grand Jeter or Nimba should be in a peace talk. I was Minister of Information, they expelled me from the peace talk. Drinking Scott was Justice Minister, they put him outside. Money Bar was Vice President, they put him outside. They put everybody outside except the people from Grand Jeter and Nima. A few of them went in one room to go negotiate. When they got through negotiating, they came out and said they had made peace. I called Dr. Guanu again. He teaches at Cottonton. I hope the TRC will check him out. He's not dead. He's a Cottonton. I called Dr. Guanu again as Minister of Information. I said, I want you to do me one favor. You are a historian. I work with you in Washington, D.C. You went to this peace talk. You were allowed to go in because you are from Nimba. They said we shouldn't go in because we're not from Nimba or Grand Jeter. I said, but I want to tell you something. That peace talk will fail. It will not work. So I want you to document the peace talk. The Ministry of Information will have money to support your research. Document the peace talk. Because when it fails, we got to go back to your notes to find out why it will fail. I asked Dr. Guano whether I did not predict the failure of the peace talk a few days after the peace talk. 1987. When I talk things in the country, people think I'm a crazy person. They don't listen to me. Then when it happened, and I forgot to tell you that when I was born, my grandmother sent to tell my father I was born. And she told my father that my grandson's name is Jirene. In Gribo, you see now? And before she died, she said this boy will grow up. He will go everywhere. People will not like him. They will say all kinds of things about him. In the end, he will always be able to say, you see now? So that my name, Queen Sense Country Blood, you see now. So Guano started a project and the war came and we all got displaced. I will go back to him later on so we can see what he notes said about what happened there. But I wanted TRC to contact Dr. Guano and verify whether I'm lying. I told him a few things. I said, Dr. Guano, let's be peace talk will fail because number one, whenever two persons are feuding, 
you need what is called a mediator. Somebody that stands in the gap between the two people. How can Nimba County and Grand Jury County have a fuss? You expel the, the, the vice president of Liberia. What secret you got to talk so much that the vice president can't hear? What is the secret between Nima and Grand Jude? We know you are Toa and Toas. But is that a reason why you expel the vice president? I said, when this speech talk breaks down, and it will break down, who will be able to call these people to account? Who? I said, I know very well that long ago, Nimba and Grand Jude had a terrible war. The war was so terrible that um, Nimba County had to get some mercenaries to help them. When the crown people were they're cursing, the crown people were trying to eliminate them. That is when they sent down to the Krukos and Tapakim, a crew mercenary, brought his boys. And they fought against Grand Judah, defeated Grand Judah. And they gave Tapet a place to live, and it's called Tapeta. Tapeta, Tapeta is not a Gyo name, it's not a Mana name, it's a crew name because it's a mercenary area where they gave him to live because he helped them to fight the crowns. When the war was over, they had a big old celebration planted cola tree, cotton trees and killed animals and decided that there will be no more war. And so on the crown side, all the children that were born, they called them Toa, war finish. All the children that were born on the Nimba side, they called them Toa, war finish. Today in Nimba and Grand Jira, you had a Toa and the Toa family coming from that same war area. I said, but this one you had in San Nicolet will fail because you expel all the mediators. We came down to Monrovia. Well, I must tell you that there was a great celebration that day in Nima County when Jackson Doe and Samia Doe said that they reconciled. Great celebration. We're all locked up in the celebration. I have five children. Four girls, one boy. The only boy I have is a result of the Nimba Peace Talk. <laughs> that night we're all celebrating. <laughs> and nine months later, I was told that a boy was born and he looks just like me. <laughs> and his mother was from Nimba County. So my mother went and got my boy. That's the only boy I got. So I usually jokingly tell my friends that of all the people who went for the peace talk, I the only one who left there with an open heart. <laughs> I have the proof today. My boy is 19 and he's studying computer science. All the other people went back to fight. How could I fight? My boy came from the mountain. I couldn't fight back. I could do my best, but I couldn't fight. Because I went to make peace, they put me out. So, by the time we hit Monrovia, President Doe really felt that he had reconciled with the Nima people. And so he started to appoint them to various positions. Mr. Justice Balazé went to the Supreme Court. I, may, I assume that for the second time or so, he went to the Supreme Court. They started to appoint people. Then the hitch came when he appointed Honorable Jackson Doe as, direct, as uh, director of the National Social Security Welfare Corporation Board. They signed him a vehicle and this and this and this, and the old man refused. And I said, I told you, you see now, everything started to hitch. When you find out things became bad, the old man had to leave town. Then when we look, not too long after that, there was somebody at a Nimba border saying he came to put 
do feet to the fire and take him off the Liberian people's back. And the war started. December 24, 1989. Nobody expected that. At least nobody that was not part of it expected that. But I must back up and tell you something before I come to that point. And Mr. Chairman, if you won't go for lunch, you let me know. I will stop. Um, may I continue? Thank you. You don't know. You see now. In 1988. I got a call from Catherine Doe, who was working at the Liberian Embassy in France. She's still there. All my witnesses just refused to die. She's still at the Liberian Embassy in France. I was Minister of Information, and she knew me because she was in the Liberian National Youth Organization and also the Liberian National Youth Council on a child's minor and I was a publicity secretary. So she called me, she said, I got something serious to tell you. And I said, what's that? She said, there's an old white man here who said he has a very important message to give you. And he can only give it to you. I said, okay, put him on. They put the old man on, and he said, uh, young man, I knew you at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. He said, I'm telling you this because I know how loyal you are to your government. He said, we had conversations many times, and you had the occasion, you had the opportunity to switch to any side, but you were loyal. That's why I'm calling you. I said, what's your name? He said, it doesn't matter now. I cannot tell you my name because of the information I got for you. It's too dangerous for me to call my name on telephone. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I want you to warn your head of state, your president, Doe, that very soon something is going to happen in Liberia. Some people have gone to Spain and have bought weapons. They have shipped those weapons to Liberia. Those weapons have been buried in the Crown Basel Forest. At the appropriate time, they will come dig them up and start a war. I need to tell you about it so you warn President Doe. He said, you know, I don't like President Doe. I do not like him. I don't know him. I do not like him. He said, but the reason why I'm telling you is because some people working on a fourth floor in the executive mansion are part of that plan to mess with him. And the only reason why I'm telling you is because me and these people were in a diamond deal. And they double-crossed me and took the diamond to Antwerp in Belgium and sold the diamond and knocked me out of the whole deal. So I'm going to expose them so Doug can deal with them. So tell Doe to send you to the embassy in France and I will give you three things. I will give you the list of arms and ammunition that they purchased in Spain. I will give you the photographs of them receiving the arms in Spain. I will give you the videotape of them receiving the arms in Spain. I will give you the name of the ship and a bill of lading number that deposited the ammunition and arms at the free port. And I will give you the map to where they buried it in the Crown Basa Forest. He said, I'm doing all of this, not because I like do, because I want to mess with the people who mess with my diamond business. And they are on the fourth floor in the executive mansion. I'm so happy that we can be here to talk this over because I've been wondering why we tell my story. I thank God for the TRC. 
look, all kinds of things happen in this town. Now, can you imagine I got that kind of information, minister of information? And I knew very well that the telephone system was bugged. So this man tells me that kind of information. How could I keep it to myself? I just, the first thing I decided, I'm not going to talk it. If I talk it, I could get in trouble. Then I said, no, I got to talk it. Because if I don't talk it, and the security picks it up, they say, why didn't tell us? But I cannot go to do with this, because do always said it's foolishness. So I decided I will go into the defense ministry. And again, my witness is not dead. Only one of them died. But the other one is very much alive. I went to the defense ministry and told Minister Allison that I wanted a meeting with him and Minister du and uh, Chief of Staff Duba, Henry Duba. He was just here a few days ago. He's still at the defense ministry as senior advisor to the Minister of Defense. Go and check him out. I went to them and I said, look, I got something very serious to tell you. They said, what's that? I said, I have information that... Um, there are arms and ammunition that have been deposited in Crown Basa Forest. And some people will come dig them up and start a war. And it was delivered at a free port. It was sent by a load boy to the Crown Basa Forest and everything. Tuba sat there very stunned and he looked at me for a long time. Then Allison said, uh, Mr. Minister, who told you that? I said, well, the gentleman who told me that said that he cannot disclose his name to me. He said, well, then, I don't want to hear about it. Saying he can't call it his name, I'm not going to deal with it. I said, okay. So, I left, went to my ministry. And Mr. Chairman, I must ask that I get five minutes recess. Could I have it now? Five minutes, just go behind there and come back. Thank you very much.